A Lecture on the Mind Enigma by Neville Goddard, dated April 28, 1969. Delve into the intricate connection between imagination and reality with Neville Goddard. Have you ever found yourself contemplating the inner workings of your mind and how you can harness it to achieve your aspirations? Perhaps you've come across discussions on visualization techniques or the mind's power to shape your reality. Tonight, let's explore a perplexing puzzle that challenges the creative mind, the relationship between imagination and reality. How can our thoughts and imaginations wield influence over our tangible reality? Does imagination possess the capability to bring about actual changes, or is this concept merely abstract? Let's embark on this fascinating exploration together and unravel how we can integrate these concepts into our own lives. Before we proceed, take a moment to subscribe to our channel for exclusive and valuable content to aid you on your journey of growth. Together, we can contribute to the creation of a more conscious and evolved world. Tonight, I refer to this as a puzzle because every creative mind encounters the challenge akin to solving a puzzle. A puzzle, as defined in the dictionary, is an object or person that is challenging to comprehend. It can also serve as a sieve to separate valuable insights from the trivial or pose an intriguing question. Now, I pose to you the question, who is the greatest of the great on earth, someone who was never born as a mortal or lived in the conventional sense in this secular world? I could use the plural form and refer to those who were never born mortal, but for tonight, let's focus on the greatest of the great on earth, the one universally adored. In my perspective, that figure is Jesus Christ. I believe you will concur when I say that none of us chose the environment in which we were born. However, we swiftly adapted to the surroundings encountered in this space-time existence, be it habits, classrooms, religion, or doctrine. This applies universally to all individuals. If they reflect honestly, they would acknowledge that they did not actively choose their environment but rather found themselves placed within it. God the Father orchestrated your placement in this particular environment because it aligns with the purpose He is fulfilling within Himself through you. Are you prepared to embrace all the repercussions of this perplexing world of beings with its intricate puzzles? God accomplished this through Jesus Christ, within you, as Christ embodies the power and wisdom of God embedded in us all. Now, let's turn our attention to the Scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 6, we are informed that the Lord God blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts to prevent them from turning and being saved. Thus, when an individual awakens after an extensive journey, and the scriptures find fulfillment in them, few will accept their message and believe in them. Most will reject them because they perceive only their moral form in the human world. They know their parents, siblings, and family, yet when they recount their unfolding experiences, disbelief prevails. Those who listen, believe, and undergo scriptural experiences will share their stories, but the masses will still deny them because their eyes were blinded and hearts were hardened. Now, believe that I am one with my Father, and the Father is in me, the words I speak are not mine but come from the one who sent me. Believe in the unity of the Father in me. I assure you, the works I have done, you shall also do, and even greater works than these. If you lack belief in me, let the works themselves be your reason to believe. God the Father is not external, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. If you turn around, you will hear, and what you see will vanish from sight. Everything currently appearing so substantial before your eyes is merely a tangible manifestation shaped by the world. I assert this from personal experience. In New York City, there exists a young boy bearing my name, now around 15 years old. Prior to his birth, he appeared to me in a vision, appearing to be about four years old. He identified himself as Neville Mars and stated that he would come on November 10th. This revelation occurred in September. The following morning, I informed my wife that a boy would join our family on November 10th. Despite her acknowledgement of miracles through me, she knew she was not pregnant. Nonetheless, I assured her of the arrival. A friend of mine, expecting a baby in December, desired a girl, having a son already. I proposed, if your son is born on November 10th and is a boy, his name is Neville Mars. Despite her certainty about a December birth, she agreed. On November 10th, Neville Mars was born, approximately five years ago. During a visit to New York City, 
The young boy approached me and expressed, Neville, I feel that if I could turn around, I would discover my true identity. I know I'm wearing a mask, and I can't wait to die because then I will turn around and see my authentic self. His mother, originally a financially disadvantaged girl who married into wealth, harbored a profound fear of anything associated with death. The prospect of losing her diamonds, home, and possessions terrified her. Consequently, she was disturbed when her child spoke about death. While growing up in that environment may have diverted the boy's attention, that was his statement five years ago. Now, let me share my own encounter. While lying in bed on my left side, I felt a force emanating from just beyond my head, in close proximity. The force was so potent that I had the urge to turn around and witness the one applying it. It felt like a person, not an impersonal force, was behind it. Despite my body being as vital as it is now, the intensity of the force at the base of my skull prevented me from turning. If I had turned on that day, I would have witnessed the being that I am instantly disappearing from this world. So, he blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes, perceive with their hearts, and turn to be saved. These same words are employed in the Greek sense of the prodigal son who, coming to himself, turned and remembered his father. He turned and returned home to receive the grand robe, the ring, the fatted calf, and shoes for his feet. Deliberately blinded by the Father in us, our hearts were hardened by the Father in us. Hence, these words are factual, and when they culminate, they will plea, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God the Father utilizes the tyrants of the world for purposes beyond their comprehension. Every individual in the world is merely a mask wielded by God the Father, playing a designated role. Man judges the mask, but the occupant remains unseen, as his eyes were blinded, and his heart was hardened. God assumes every role based on the environment in which he was placed, not by his own volition, as we were subjected to futility. Not by choice, but by the will of the one who subjected us with hope, we cannot turn back until his predetermined purpose is fulfilled. Christ is not and never was a moral being. Those who believe he was born from a woman's womb lack the capacity to comprehend when it is stated who Christ truly is or who the Father really is. The statement he who sees me sees the father remains an enigma to them, beyond their grasp. However, when the culmination of all human experience takes the form of a youth who addresses him as a father, the enigma is unraveled. David, the one who perceives you and sees the father. Yet, he, as the greatest on earth, had no moral birth, just like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus Christ. Clad in these moral garments, you and I bring his drama to life, as it is only the father playing all roles, willingly bearing all consequences of this harrowing experience for himself in Christ. God the Father perceives Christ as distinct from the one who sent him, but he who sees me sees the one who sent me. Behold, we are one, the entirety within me was dispatched to adorn myself in this fleshly garment you see. He stationed me on the small island of Barbados in 1905 amidst many siblings, in a constrained environment without social, intellectual, or financial training. The sieve, the enigma, sifted the wheat before 1905. I couldn't endure the induced environment and felt the restlessness of a boy eager to continue my quest. My only noteworthy physical punishment in this world was due to the Bible. In response to my schoolmaster's question, I uttered, take up your bed and walk. When he asked for my Bible, and I couldn't produce it, he was permitted to beat me. I was beaten from my buttocks to my feet because of the Bible. Yet, my entire life has been stirred by the Word of God. I know from experience that if a man could just turn around, his eyes would no longer be blind, and his hardened heart would soften because he would see that he, the very being sent into the world, is one with the Father. You and your Father are one, you would perceive the only begotten Son of God as a radiant being the only God, and you would recognize yourself as you truly are. Now, we are taught that all baptized in Christ have clothed themselves with Christ, and all are one in Jesus Christ. This is true, for when you encounter Him, you are baptized. The one with infinite love sent you into this world of horror, where you kill and are killed, rape and are raped, mutilate and are mutilated. When you have experienced it all, you will turn around, and everything will be forgiven. Then you will return to your eternal home, brighter because you have shed what you wore. 
you must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. The moment you turn around, you are perfect, for you are the Father clothed in your garment of perfection. The blind see, the deaf hear, the mute shout for joy, for all you see is perfect. I know this because it is the end of my journey. So, I say to you, take courage, no matter what you have been through, what you may still have to go through, or what you are currently facing. One day, you will be baptized in Jesus Christ, you will turn around, seeing Him. You are incorporated into His being. To be baptized is to be completely covered with fluid, not water, because the Messiah is Christ, and the Messiah is the placenta, the one anointed with oil. What the Pope does here has nothing to do with it. There is a living fluid, living water, that you pass through to merge, just as a drop of water merges with the ocean. Yet, your identity or individuality is never lost, all are one, and all will be baptized in that oneness. Everyone will be clothed in the Lord, signifying simply living as if entering a garment and flowing with it. The final words of Christ in the book of Luke instruct to remain in the city until clothed with power from on high. The power is Christ, the wisdom is Christ. To be clothed is to encompass. In other words, wait until I have clothed you with myself. On that day, you will explicitly say, I am in Christ, and Christ is in me. Believe me when I say, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. If you cannot believe that, then believe in the works themselves, for truly, I say to you, the works I do, you will do, and greater works than these will you do because I am going to the Father, leaving the world and returning to the Father. The entire drama of the scriptures unfolds within us and has nothing to do with any being born mortal. Christ in you is the hope of glory, born from within and not walking the earth as one born of a woman's womb. So, who is Christ? This is the enigma of enigmas question in all scriptures. In the book of Proverbs, the question is asked, who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? What is the name of his son? Surely, you know who has established all the ends of the earth. The Father of fathers, of infinite love, whose son is David. He is the one who established all the ends of the earth and sustains them from within you. You are his suffering servant, who is himself. Chapter 53 of Isaiah, called the last of God's suffering servants, begins like this, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? My arm has been revealed, it has been completely unveiled to those being prepared to tell the story. So, I tell what happened to me, but who will believe? This power that must be revealed in you is not a human demonstration but the unfolding of your divinity. After your arm has been revealed, when you leave this world, you are at the right hand of the Father because you are David. Your right hand reveals God the Father in you, for there is nothing but God. Not God in you, just God. You will discover unity in adversity, community in diversity. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Here is the composite unity, one made of others, diversity and unity, just as I am in death, and diversity dwells in me and we are one, just as I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. I am plural, and you are plural in me singular. Here is the diversity in unity. I look at myself and see my world pushed out. Now, I can see diversity in unity as everything within me, everything I see, though appearing outside, is within me. My own marvelous human imagination, of which this world of mortality is just a shadow. I can tell you that it has been determined that the last will be the first and how they will do it, having separated. All are moving toward the final event. I am not saying this to flatter those who attend my meetings because whether you come or not makes no difference to my way of life. I am no longer interested in the things of this world or entangled in the shadows, for I know that the greatest of the great never walked the earth and was never born mortal. I have no desire to establish anything here for the shadows to praise how wonderful I am. All of us are walking towards the inevitable end, turning like the prodigal son and being embraced by the Father, thus becoming the Father. On that day, you can forgive everyone, knowing that they do not know what they do. Believe me, every word of scripture is true because I have experienced it, but not the secular story, it is the story of salvation. I heard, well, swallow each other the other day. He is a great old man of 80 now. Yet, 
one who sees the world as a history book and has no idea about the scriptures, he can quote it from cover to cover. However, he is not alone. My sister's maid can quote the Bible beautifully but has no real understanding of life. Well, the boy quotes the Bible beautifully, but he has no real concept of who Abraham, Isaac, Moses, Jacob, or any of those who were never born mortal are. They are eternal spiritual states through which all men pass, starting with the state of Abraham, the friend, the companion of the father, who is buried. With this, your ear is attuned, and it tells the story of redemption. He said, you will be enslaved while wearing the garment of death, then he will bring you up to have much more than you had before entering, for the power of God and his wisdom will be increased because of this challenge that God has placed upon himself. So, in the end, you will turn and see yourself as infinite love, merge, and become one with the Eternal Father. Everyone will turn to the Father and enter into this wonderful unity of Christ. Therefore, here is the diversity, yet unity in diversity, just as diversity in unity. As you insist on what I said tonight, it is an enigma, and enigmas are difficult to understand. There is no greater enigma than this, the enigma of enigmas, which is Christ. I tell you an incredible story, the story of someone whose birth will influence everyone, the one who speaks the only truth, born but not born mortal. I speak of someone who dies but rises from the dead. This incredible story is summed up in a person called Christ. He was not born mortal, he never walked the earth except within you. Still, rising from within, you experience everything said about Jesus in the scriptures, thus unraveling an enigma of Christ. The Old Testament is the enigma, and when Christ awakens within you, he has deciphered the enigma. So, when you tell about this enigma without an enigma, those who hear it will judge it by human standards. I was sifted long ago, now I know that I came into this world to be touched in Christ. I was not satisfied with the environment in which I was placed at my moral birth and felt restless, knowing that I was destined to grow into something different. So, I began my quest to completely unveil the Christ in me, and now I am telling the story. I tell it as best I can, but I know that few will hear with faith. Some will love it, others will reject it. Some will hear and believe but be afraid of societal reactions, so they will keep silent. This is told in chapter 12 of John, where it says that many heard and believed, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it lest they be put out of the synagogue. The synagogue of the ancient world is still with us today. Today, the current Pope is asking for Luther to be brought back into the fold. He was excommunicated 100 years ago, and now they want to bring him back. Have you heard such absurdity? This is not Alice in Wonderland. How can you forgive a man who has been dead for 100 years? I tell you, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. This goes for the Pope to the one shining shoes and thinking he is blessed because he can do it. Let Christ awaken in you. One day, you will turn and find joy in his return. I was sent to the presence of the resurrected Christ. I did not turn, if I had turned, I would not be here. I was sent to his presence to answer the question asked of me, to be incorporated into his body so I can complete the journey. At any moment between now and my departure from this world, I can turn. When I do, you will read Neville's obituary. My journey is at its end, I have fought the good fight and finished the race. This I know from my own experience. Tonight, I hope I have been able to unravel the enigma because the greatest enigma in the world is in Jesus Christ the one who is your marvelous human imagination. Now, let us enter into silence.